He is an honorary clinical professor of trauma surgery at Brighton and Sussex University Hospitals. He has recently retired from the Royal Navy at the rank of Surgeon Commander after completing over two decades of military service with distinction. After graduating from King's College London in 2000, he undertook his house officer training in Plymouth and Portsmouth, followed by three years of military posts. Hello, thank you very much for the opportunity to present yet again at the Asian Collaboration for Trauma. So the topic I've been given today is the top three lessons I have found or learned in military trauma surgery. And yet, as with all of my talks, please feel free, sit back and enjoy the journey with me. Now, first of all, usual standard slide. These views are mine, mine alone, and represent nobody of any importance. Now, one of the first things I want you to take away is when anybody turns around to you and asks you a question, is this glass half empty or is this glass half full? Well, I'm a glass full kind of a person. And the reason why I say the glass is full is it's half full of water, half full of air. Yet again, it is full of something. And this is what we like to do with our trauma patients is we like to keep them full. We don't like them bleeding out. We don't like to over transfuse them. We need to keep everything in the right possible balance. So the glass portrays my outlook on life that everything is always full, but also I try and keep my patients full as well within the remit. Now, the first lesson I want to come up to you is when we talk about the golden hour. Now, the golden hour in the infancy of pre-hospital medicine was probably a really, really big thing. And in vast, quite a considerable areas around the world, it is still quite important. But what I would say is the hour itself is just a time frame. The biggest thing for the patient is to get to the hospital as quick as possible. And that's where the platinum 10 minutes comes in. If somebody's exsanguinating out there or they've had a cardiac arrest, the quicker you get a medical intervention or them to definitive care is what matters. Because as you're probably sick and tired of hearing from me is nobody should die from hemorrhage and young people when they are subjected to trauma will compensate really really well all the way up until they cannot compensate they don't have the classic you know just like dropping blood pressure slight increase in heart rate what happens to them is they compensate 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 and before you know it they drop and they arrest therefore the golden hour I think it should be the maximum time you allow and we should go anywhere between platinum and golden with ideally point of injury interventions being the utmost importance as can be demonstrated from all of our interventions in Afghanistan and Iraq. The reasons why our casualties survived was because somebody put a tourniquet on their arms and legs and packed wounds within a matter of moments of them being injured. So get control quickly. Golden hour theoretically exists, but of paramount importance is getting control as quickly as possible. So what's lesson two then? Prolonged field care. God, I hate this phrase. Prolonged field care to me will always mean suboptimal medical care. Because remember, when a country sends out soldiers, it is a conscious decision whether to deploy an entire hospital behind them, a small field unit, whatever resources allow them to achieve their objective. But remember, prolonged field care is not a medical decision. Prolonged field care is a medical intervention for a command decision. So what we're trying to do, and I've got some good slides demonstrating this, is holding on to a sicker patient than you can care for, for longer than you want, with fewer resources than you need in a place you don't want to be. So basically, that doesn't sound like somebody wanting to provide optimal medical care. What they're doing here is providing the best they possibly can in a situation they don't want to be in with the, without the resources that they wanted. So it is always a command decision. And what this basically brings us on to is if you can't bring the patient back, you have to push capability forward. Yet again, it is a command decision is how much capability do you want to push forward? How much intervention do you want to achieve? What is your accepted casualty rate? And in fact, in some cases, what is your fatality rate? So prolonged field care, yet again is something that I have added 
try to fight against and try to get the optimal care we can for soldiers and military personnel going forward. Four echelons of care, I'll put this down as an aid of Are they definitive or are they prolonged field care? Well, definitive care is always going to be your echelon three, roll three facility, okay, where you have everything that you require to keep that patient alive. Everything beyond that is in fact a degree, I believe, of prolonged field, um, prolonged field care. But I'm known, to, I'm known to cause a degree of conflict and debate, so we'll continue. What's lesson number three? Well, I really, really get tired and fed up when people interchange military and trauma surgery. There are two distinct entities. A military surgeon may not be a trauma surgeon and a trauma surgeon may not to be a military surgeon. Ideally, you want the Venn diagrams to overlap where you get this very well-trained individual who can operate as part of a wider team, okay? They're not, they're not the same. Ideally, what we wanna try and achieve is that location there. We want a hybrid between an elective surgeon, a trauma surgeon, acute care surgeon, you know, that is where we want the military surgeon to be placed. And with the military surgeon, you have the caveat of military training. Military operations have a variety of tempos. They can be, you know, you could be sitting around waiting for things to happen. You could be in highly volatile kinetic situations, or you can be in a humanitarian. All of those environments require this skill set with the survivability and the training that you have as a military surgeon. So I was to asked to give you three lessons, but as with anything in surgery, and anything I talk about, I occasionally lie. It's like when you ask for wishes, okay? Your third wish is always, can I have three more wishes? Well, I lied. I'm going to put two more in. So what's lesson number four I want to take away? Well, military surgery is high tempo. You need to learn how to do gunshot wounds. You need to be able to deal with ballistics, blast injuries, you know, everything. Well, that is actually a fallacy, I reckon, okay? That is a misinterpretation of what military surgery is because it fundamentally depends on the mission. It depends on whether it's a kinetic operation with high amounts of lead traveling in both directions or even in one direction, okay? Whether it's a peacekeeping mission where you are there as a contingency measure, whether you're there to provide care just in case that's you required, okay? And finally, whether it's humanitarian. So if you look at it, when you look at a kinetic environment, You've got a high flow of casualties, a high tempo, okay? And uh, your skill level actually increases during the operation because the more you're exposed to something, the more you have got um, immersion into a certain area, the better you get. You know, the more you run, the quicker your pace gets. The more weight you lift, the stronger your upper body gets. The more you're in a kinetic environment, the better you get at dealing with people with gunshot wounds. The problem then happens in peacekeeping. If you're on a three to six month peacekeeping operation, how do you know you are surgically operating at the highest possible tempo, okay? At the highest possible level. You do get skill fade. And with the UK military, we found this out to be approximately three months is when skill fade happens. So no surgical team will deploy for more than three months because that's what happens. And then finally, humanitarian, which is a whole separate skill set. The first thing that happens with a major disaster or civil unrest is uh, lots of premature labors. Ladies go into labor. It's what happens. They basically start to deliver because it's a really stressful environment. And if you speak to the vast majority of humanitarian surgeons, the first thing that happens after an earthquake, you know, major cyclone, hurricane, is a massive influx of early, early preg uh, labors. So this is an example of, you know, low tempo. I've got one of my aesthetic colleagues sat out there in South Sudan. It wasn't really that high tempo. We had maybe half a dozen, dozen operations to do in that period, but we were there. We were skilled and ready to go. And the key thing here is, is if you are in an environment where you have got the potential of skill fade, is always keep your brain going. Always keep exercising. But the key thing is, don't exercise too much because you get exercise fade and moulage fade, okay? Where you're like, I have moulaged more than I care 
to do, I'm done. So you need to create the right environment and mindset to undertake these interventions. So what's illusion number five? Well, what's the capability of forward surgical teams? This depends on what is the mission. If you're put in front of a forward surgical team, what is required? What resources do you have? I mean, the key thing here is, do you have enough resources here to, what's the word I'm looking for? Deal with the, with the workload. Do you have the consumables? Do you have the blood? Do you have uh, the surgical sets? Do you have the manpower? Can you actually deal with whatever is coming through? There's no point going to a highly kinetic environment with five units of packed red cells, okay? When you go to these things, you need to have the resources to deal with it. With a forward surgical team, you may only have two beds. Um, no point saying we can cater for 10 patients coming in because that's going to be lunacy. You have to cater for the resources you have. You also need to be able to make difficult decisions. And the difficult decisions are, especially when you're talking about these moulages, when you do the moulages, when you're bringing patients in through, you're like, I have six casualties, I have two operating theatre tables, but I only have five units of blood. They're all really badly injured. Who's going to survive? So those are the kind of difficult decisions that's required. And you can't learn those just by going there. You need to have these impart and package of your daily life, daily interventions, and daily thought processes, okay? You need to think about these things regularly with the team. So you're singing off the same hymn sheet, I want to say, because the last thing you want to do is deploy with individuals to an environment and have difficult conversations with them for the first time in those sort of places. That is why you prepare together as a team and you deploy together as a team. And the biggest myth I've learned at all is, you know, different militaries from different nations. Well, we don't speak together. Well, that is complete and utter nonsense. I have made some fantastic friends from throughout the world as part of the ACT, as well as API MSF, okay? An organization well worthwhile being part of and a great, great venture. OK, because you only get to progress and develop in your modalities and in your skill set by collaborating. And you collaborate with people who you have, haven't really worked with in environments and worked with them before. So I think this is where we take this forward. And last but not least, no talk is a talk of mine without my usual um, plug of books to read but remember books don't teach you how to do stuff they teach you the basics of how to begin your journey and if you do have, if you questions, do have any questions please, please let me know so the first um reactor to deliver her reaction to the previous presentation we have here with us dr amira al hassan who is a specialist general surgeon from kuwait she is the Advanced Trauma Life Support Course Director and State Faculty in Kuwait and a Fellow of the American College of Surgeons and a member of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh and the Spanish Society for Surgical Research. Dr. Al-Hassan has a vast interest in academia and research and has worked with several prestigious journals. She is very active on social media and runs the So Me Trauma Educational Community on Twitter. Please welcome Dr. Amira Al-Hassan. Thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you, Professor Khan, for these invaluable insights. And uh, thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me to this prestigious event. I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Yes, right. yes, so, now they're here. Thank you. So the underlying message from Professor Khan's presentation is very important. And that is despite the uniqueness and challenges of military surgery, we should always aim to offer the best to our patients. That is the best time frame for management, which is typically the shortest time frame since injury, and the best resources. Resources means equipment, blood products, transport, critical care facilities. Now, as surgeons, we acknowledge how difficult that can be to attain. Even in an ideal elective setting, um, you, come up, you find yourself craving a better suture, a more angulated 
uh, scope, um, more curved needle. So it's not always easy to attain the best resource setting. Uh, it's more challenging in the military setting, of course, and the best surgical personnel. That can be challenging. And the key word here, as Professor Khan pointed out, is preparation. Um, to, military surgery is not typically addressed by modern surgical residency programs. So it is something you have to actively apply for and prepare for prior to deployment. Um, some tips from colleagues who are deployed in our part of mi the Middle East is to go for courses and, um, uh, and preparatory um, online sessions, whether online or in person, prior to being deployed. So for example, if you're used to working in the abdomen and you expect to see a lot of limb injury, take an orthopedics course before uh, deployment. Read up, brush up on your knowledge. You don't want to brush up on basic surgical principles in the field. And I highly recommend using the books that Professor Khan pointed out, usually on, um, and a military surgeon in Kuwait, you'll find one of them carrying this on their flights to Kuwait. And um, definitely get in touch and collaborate with colleagues, those who have been there before you, uh, those who are deployed with other militaries, and even try to get in touch with surgeons who are in your area of deployment, civilian surgeons. They'll be more than happy to accommodate you on your day off to ground rounds where you can help yourself brush up on your knowledge or maybe scrub in if you're allowed to and prevent scale fade. So preparation is key. And so my two cents on this is in an ideal world, there'd be no wars and no conflicts and we would not be, have to have this conversation. But our world is far from ideal. So the key is to prepare our military surgeons prior to deployment. Uh, I personally believe that modern technology will help us prepare uh, them better. Uh, that is the use of simulation training, augmented reality, and telemedicine. I see a lot of scope and hope um, for this technology in preparing military surgeons. And to sum up, I would say, um, probably reiterating what Professor Khan said, always aim for the best, but prepare for the worst. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. al -Hassan. Very well said. Our second reactor is Dr. Chen Li Chen. I hope I said that correctly. He is the former president of the Formosa Association for the Surgery of Trauma and currently an attending physician at the National Chung Kung University in Taiwan. Sir, please take the virtual floor. Can you hear me? It's my great honor to have an opportunity to listen to Dr. Musu's wonderful lecture. It's very inspiring, very educating. It, you know, I woke up in a, I grew up in a Navy base, and his lecture about a, a surgeon's commitment and a great achievement is very, very impressive. He a lot of talk. He gotta be the a, one of the ten commandments of the trauma care, because that is really need for us. We don't have a war daily basis, but actually we have some trauma cases, so we have to do our best to optimize every care for our patient. A lot of uh, acute care surgeons and a lot of emergency physicians, they have to have this great opportunity to listen to Dr. Musu's wonderful lecture. Because a lot of- Is Dr. Chen Li Chen. I hope I said that correctly. He is the former president of the Formosa Association for the Surgery of Trauma and currently an attending physician at the National Chung Kung University in Taiwan. Sir, please take the virtual floor. It's my great honor to have the opportunity to listen to Dr. Musu's wonderful lecture. It's very inspiring, very educating. It. You know, I woke up in a, I grew up in a Navy base, and his lecture about a, a surgeon's commitment and a great achievement is very, very impressive. He a lot of talk, he gotta be the, uh, one of the 10 commandments of the trauma care because that is really need for us. We don't have a war daily basis, but actually we have some trauma cases. So we have to do our best to optimize every care for our patient. A lot of uh, acute care surgeons and a lot of emergency physicians they have to have this great opportunity to listen to Dr. Musu's wonderful lecture. Because a lot of people, we have to fight. We have to struggle very hard to get their life back. You know, as a trauma surgeon, I have to show my uh, hearty 
a greatest uh, respect to uh, Dr. So Meso. It's a wonderful lecture. And a couple of things really, really for our uh, uh, acute care surgeon have to listen about that. Like the uh, prolonged fear care, and like the, no one should be dying because of hemorrhage in the hospital. This is so important for us to remember that all the time. A lot of people just uh, try to uh, make a peace with the uh, trauma surgeon, try to make a peace with the ER doctor. That's not right. We have to provide our optimal care as a system way. So I have to say uh, once again to show my uh, respect from the bottom of my, from my heart and I wish the, uh, Dr. Masur can give us more lecture about that. Thank you so much, Dr. Masur.